Welcome to Term Talk, an FJC video podcast. This podcast is one of several short videos to acquaint federal judges with this term's Supreme Court holdings. One case involves subpoenas issued by the House of Representatives, and the other case involves subpoenas issued in a state criminal proceeding. With me today are Dean Erwin Chimarinsky of the UC Berkeley School of Law and Professor Evan Lee of UC Hastings Law. Evan and Erwin, Thanks for talking with me today. So, Erwin, the subpoena cases both involve, as I said, the power to subpoena the personal records of a sitting president. But different purposes are at play and different sovereigns are involved. Is there a common theme of these cases? Yes. In both cases, President Trump claimed <clears throat> that a president is protected by absolute immunity and there cannot be a subpoena of his financial records directed at anyone not his accountant, not his bank, not him. And in both cases, the Supreme Court rejected this claim of absolute immunity. So let's start with Trump versus Mazars, the dispute between Congress and the presidency. Erwin, can you tell us what happened there? There were actually two cases. One involved a House committee that subpoenaed financial records from Mazars, President Trump's accountant. Another involved a House committee that subpoenaed records from Deutsche Bank, President Trump's bank. In both instances, President Trump went to federal court to quash the subpoena and went to the Supreme Court. And as I said, the Supreme Court rejected absolute presidential immunity from such subpoenas. But the court also said there has to be sensitivity to separation of powers issues. The court, and it was a 7-2 decision, said that there's a four-part test that indicates what needs to be looked at in deciding whether there can be such subpoenas. The court said, first, does the asserted legislative purpose warrant the significant step of intruding on the president, or are there other ways to get the information? Second, the subpoena must be no broader than necessary to achieve the congressional purpose. Third, the court says, there must be careful attention to the purpose for the subpoenas, and the more detailed Congress is in justifying them, the better. And fourth, courts have to assess what the burden would be on the president in having these subpoenas complied with. So, Evan, do you think this decision is based on the lack of specificity in the House subpoenas, or is there more going on? I think that's part of it. Um, but I think beyond that, um, and particularly if you look through the four factors that Irwin just enumerated, and I would say in particular the third having to do with examining carefully uh, the legislative uh, justifications um, for the subpoena. Um, I think the court is expressing a certain amount of skepticism about why President Trump's papers in particular and the document, family documents um, were necessary for legislative subpoenas. So for example, there was a question of legislation about money laundering, um, an issue of legislation about terrorism, and even assuming that uh, there's money laundering or uh, some sort of connection to terrorism that uh, might be um, in these papers, um, I, I think the court was sort of asking, well, what about all the other papers uh, of all you know that are held by everybody else? Um, why these in particular? So I think that probably had something to do with it. Well, Evan, the Vance case involved subpoenas by the state's attorney's office acting on behalf of a grand jury. Was the court and how did the court's analysis differ for this situation? The majority here rejects President Trump's argument that state criminal subpoenas have to be categorically. Um, prohibited, that is to say, absolute immunity, because uh, again, the court looks back at experience. It says two centuries of experience confirm that a properly tailored criminal subpoena uh, will not normally hamper, you know, the 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 operation of the presidency. Um, as to the argument about harassment, the court says, well, there have always been sufficient. Um, uh, tools at uh, the behest of uh, judges to deal with um, a case where they think harassment is going on. Um, the majority furthermore uh, rejected uh, an argument for a heightened standard um, on three grounds. Uh, they said, number one, um, immunity shouldn't extend 
to personal private papers, which are uh, which were at stake in this case. Second, they said that heightened scrutiny wasn't necessary um, to protect the official duties of a president. And third, uh, the majority said that there's an overriding public interest here in fair and effective law enforcement. So Irwin, what are the takeaways for the federal courts from these cases? I think there is an important substantial difference between these cases. The media tend to group them together. But in the Trump versus Vance case, the Supreme Court was so emphatic that a president does not have the ability to invoke any special protections when the subpoena is material by a grand jury. The court emphasized that the law has the right to every person's evidence. With regard to Trump versus Mazars, what the court there said was that there's got to be more sensitivity to separation of powers issues and articulated that four-part test that I mentioned. And so I think the court is really treating state grand juries quite different from congressional committees. Okay, so were either of you surprised by the holdings in these cases? I confess that I was. If you'd have asked me a oral argument, I would have predicted exactly the opposite. I would have thought the court would have been much more concerned by the idea that every district attorney everywhere in the United States now can try to subpoena records from the president. And I thought the court would have been more deferential to Congress as a co-equal branch of government. Instead, what we saw was the court not wanting to put much in the way of limits on grand juries, but wanting to put much more significant limits on congressional committees. How about you, Evan? Well, I, I was struck by uh, the Chief Justice's language uh, in Mazars about the relationship between uh, Congress and the president. He really emphasized that the Constitution, the structure of the Constitution, puts Congress and the president in a rivalry, if you will, um, for political power and influence in the operation of American constitutional government. And the point he seems to make is that in this uh, wrestling match, if you will, uh, the two players have to observe the rules. And that if Congress is permitted to use its legislative subpoena power to, you know, get a leg up on the president, if you will, um, that that runs afoul of the rules. And so the, uh, and so the court had to uh, pull back on that. But on the other hand, um, in the Vance case, you have what I think the court regarded more as a normal operation of criminal uh, justice proceedings, of the administration of criminal justice, of which the subpoena power is is part. And I think there the court sort of said, well, you know, neither state prosecutors nor state courts are really in a political, uh, normally in a political wrestling match with the president of the United States. They sort of mm -hmm. operate in separate spheres, so there's not the same need for any kind of, uh, you know, heightened scrutiny. Well, you know, Irwin, as you said, it's not really hard to imagine that there could be litigation in any number of districts involving grand juries. But what really is the reach of Mazars? Well, I think the reach of both cases is that any federal district court anywhere in the country might have to deal with motions by a president to quash a subpoena because any district attorney might be engaged in an investigation depending on what happened against a president. And there's going to be congressional subpoenas in the future. And the congressional subpoenas are directed at the president's accountants or the president's banks or whoever's got the president's records, wherever they might be located. In fact, of these three cases, two arose in the Southern District of New York, because that's where the accountant and the bank were. One arose in Washington, D.C. Well, thanks, Erwin and Evan. Um, thank you for talking with me about it, and I um, hope to see you in person sometime soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Likewise.